Well, welcome into this week's Degrees of Science. You've probably heard a lot in the news of a busy hurricane season expected in the Atlantic Ocean. Well, in this week's Degrees of Science, we wanted to talk to the expert that actually put together this forecast. Today we're talking with Matt Rosencrans, NOAA's lead hurricane seasonal forecaster. So, Matt, I guess first off, before we get too deep into it, what is the forecast looking like for this hurricane season? Yeah, so we're expecting a busy one. Uh, 17 to 25 named storms, which are tropical storms or subtropical storms. Um, so once the National Hurricane Center names them, they, they get a check box in that column. Um, so 17 to 25 of those, right? Well, normal is only 14, so we're expecting about 50% more than normal. So on your end, since you're looking more seasonal forecasts, what, what all key factors are you looking at to put together this forecast? Yeah, so the kind of 600 pound gorilla in the room this year was the sea surface temperatures in the Atlantic. Uh, they have been record warm this year and they're currently, well, we're in June now, and those temperatures were looking like they are nor normally averaged in the end of August to early September. Um, so we're months ahead of schedule on those. And that water is just fuel for storms. Um, and then we're also looking at La Nina in the Pacific, which is the change in sea surface temperatures and winds in the Pacific. Um, and La Nina, once we get into that phase, we'll be in that for the you know five or six, at least six or eight months after that. Um, and we're expected to be in that during the peak of this year's hurricane season. Um, and that makes hurricane formation in the Gulf of Mexico and the Western Caribbean uh, more likely in years where we don't have a La Nina. So those are the kind of two biggest things we looked at. So talking El Nino and La Nina, so we're, we're kind of in the process of switching. First of all, what does, you know, people are probably thinking water in the Pacific Ocean, how, how does that impact Atlantic hurricanes? Yeah, right, it seems like it's way over there, um, but it impacts things right over here. Um, so when you change the sea surface temperatures and the wind patterns in the Pacific, that eventually changes the jet stream over the Pacific, which that jet stream then takes those downstream changes and changes the wind patterns over uh, North America into the Caribbean. Um, but what it really does in the Atlantic is it reduces wind shear. It reduces wind speeds up at about 35,000 feet. And that's more conducive for her tropical storms and hurricanes to form. So, you know, we, we're kind of in that transition period. How hard does it make you or for you? Because El Nino and La Nina, not the easiest thing to forecast when it's switching and changing. If your forecast is really keyed on that, how hard is it to uh, manipulate that forecast knowing that it's not the easiest thing to forecast at times? Yeah, so the six month kind of forecast for La Nina and El Nino, um, those are about 70, 80% right. Um, and then, but they only control about 35 to 40% of the variability in hurricanes in the Atlantic. Um, so it's only about a third of the forecast. The other third are those sea surface temperatures uh, that I talked about. And then the remaining third are monsoon activity in the, in the in West Africa um, and some of the wind patterns that develop over the Atlantic, just local to the Atlantic. That's the remaining part of that. So it is a lot of the forecast. It's the single biggest piece of the forecast, but it's not the entire thing. Um, so, and it's also why our forecast, we have an 85% chance of an above normal season we also have a range of storms, 17 to 25 named storms. If the La Nina develops a little bit later, we'll probably be at the lower end of that range. If it develops earlier and more intense, we'll probably be at the higher end of that range. So that's why we have those ranges to account for those little bits of uncertainty um, that we don't have perfect prediction systems for yet. So you're expecting a very busy season. How does this look kind of historically when we're talking how busy it's gonna be? Yeah, so we've had years uh, with 30 named storms. Uh, that was 2020. Uh, 2005 had 28 named storms. And then 2021 had 21 named storms. So if we get to the 25 named storms, it would be the third busiest in the history of our um, counts in the Atlantic, which go back to the 1850s. 2005 was my first year in, in TV straight out of college. And I was Ooh. like, wow, is this, you know, yeah. And then after that, I was like, oh, yeah, it's a bo boring season for a few years after that. So uh, is this something that we still expect fluctuation like this? Or is it with the sea surface temperatures continuing to get warmer, we expect this kind of upward tick with uh, overall hurricane numbers? So there's no clear link that warmer sea surface temperatures always mean more tropical storms. 
There are some clear links that it means more of those tropical storms could get to hurricane strength. More of those tropical storms are going to bring more coastal flooding and heavier rainfall amounts with them. So the flooding and the disaster potential over land, uh, once the storm comes inland, you know, as it moves into Texas and then they kind of, they, the winds start to come down a little bit, they can dump devastating amounts of rains further in. The tropical storm Allison is kind of our famous case study for that. Only a tropical storm, but dropped, you know, a, a foot or more of rain in some places. Um, so those are the kind of impacts um, that we're like, likely to see, those heavier rains, uh, more of the storms making hurricane strength rather than staying at tropical storm strength. Those are the kind of changes, but there's no real, there's nothing in the modeling and the future projections about any major changes to the numbers of hurricanes. That tends, is gonna to tend to go up and down sea surface temperatures that year and El Nino and La Nina, the interplay with those. So you're speaking of modeling and stuff like that and us learning the forecast for El Nino and La Nina. How much better has the seasonal forecasting for hurricanes got with uh, just better technology and what we're learning? Yeah, so we have kind of two major periods within NOAA's forecasting, 1999 to 2008. There was a lot of statistical relationships. We're about 52%, 53%, right? Um, and then 2008, we really start to incorporate those numerical models. Um, so 2008 to 2022, um, we've actually been up around 70% for our forecast. So, um, and that's our goal is to be at 70%. And so we knew we needed that technology. Um, we've got modeling that comes in from the US, our teams here at within NOAA, there's uh, three different models that we run. Um, I also partner with the European Center and their modeling and the UK Met Office. Um, so we have um, Environment Canada. So there's lots of modeling places in the world that contribute to this forecast. Um, so there's, there's a lot of good technologies come in there. So you're talking about El Nino, La Nina, that switch and when exactly does. Y'all do an updated forecast uh, during the season, right? We do. So the hurricane forecast will get updated in early August. Um, and that's really to grab that latest information from June and July. Um, but still make an outlook before we get to the peak of the hurricane season, right? That's August, September, October. That's 90% of your tropical storm activity. Um, and really August 20th and later is 75% of your activity in the Atlantic. So we do take that time to do an up update at the beginning of August. I, I really appreciate you taking time to talk with us. And I think we're all geared up and ready for what's likely to be a pretty busy season. I, and that's the hope, right? I hope people take this information and they use it to get ready for that season. You know, are they, if they're closer to the water, if they're further inland, if you, even if you live inland, do you have a house near the water? Well, do you have to protect that from that flooding, protect your inland from winds? Um, just kind of understand those risks and take that chance to get ready now. Well, Matt, I appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Sure.